Mr. Tooth Decay here. You know, making cavities used to be easy, but it's getting harder now. And mostly because of... Gross! Gross bites cavities, so I'm gonna bite grass! Now, grass got fluoride in it, and best is always telling people to match the beats, have checkups, and brush off it with grass! Fluoride. It is hailed by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention as one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. In fact, for over 60 years, the American Dental Association has stated that brushing with fluoride toothpaste will prevent tooth decay. But is this true? Is there more to this story than what we've been told? Triumph over tooth decay. Procter & Gamble announces Crest Toothpaste with Floristan, its exclusive fluoride compound, world's greatest weapon against decay. Look, Mom, no cavities. Yes, Crest Toothpaste really cuts down cavities because Crest has fluoride, the same fluoride dentists put right on teeth to prevent decay. With Crest, you put this fluoride on your teeth at home, too. Prevent cavities. Use Crest. Crest is accepted by the American Dental Association. Today, 95% of the toothpaste sold in the United States contains fluoride, and 72% of all water is fluoridated. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Anything we can do to help prevent cavities on children, I think, is very important. Absolutely, fluoride is safe, it's effective. Fluoridation of community water is extremely safe and extremely effective in preventing tooth decay. Science is on the side of fluoride being safe and effective. There is no controversy about this in the scientific community. If it's such a simple issue, how is it that it's still going on after half a century? I remember it being debated yeah, when well, I was 13 years ago. And, and it's continuously debated. But just because we've been doing something 50 years doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. Uh, public health officials knew then what they know now. Would we have fluoride? Would it be added to our drinking water? Well, today a coalition of scientists, dentists, and doctors are taking action to stop fluoridation until it is proven safe. The first widespread commercial use of fluoride was for the eradication of vermin. Since the 1800s, sodium fluoride has been a key ingredient in rat poison and insecticides. These products were commonly used in and around the home to kill lice, mice, rats, and insects. Fluoride proved to be not only a good way to kill rodents, but also an effective way to kill a man. As the use of fluoride became more popular, reports began flooding in of people dying from ingesting this toxic substance. Headlines screamed, Roach poisoned in pancakes kills 11 men. Rancher takes dose of poison by mistake. Article after article, all having the same tragic endings, proving that sodium fluoride can and does indeed cause death. In fact, during the last part of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution was taking hold of the modern world. An unfortunate byproduct of this technological revolution was that it created the most toxic pollutants known to man. And the most hazardous and destructive of them all was fluoride. In his award-winning book, The Fluoride Deception, investigative journalist Christopher Bryson examines fluoride's disturbing history. Bryson notes that in its early days, fluoride was a widely known and well-documented killer. Documentation from early lawsuits against fluoride manufacturers clearly shows that fluoride was a hazard, not only to humans, but to the environment as well, with damages reaching into the tens of millions of dollars. By 1930, the aluminum industry was the largest and most influential fluoride polluter. Industrial giants such as Alcoa knew they had to do something. Vegetation and livestock near Alcoa plants were being decimated as toxic fluoride fumes lingered, rendering nearby cattle lame and crippled, even causing death. One newspaper article from that time proclaimed, During the past year, we had 51 head of cattle die. 
We had laboratory tests made, and these tests show excessive amounts of fluorine in the liver and kidneys. Also, some of our young cows had lost their teeth. Our saddle horses were so crippled from fluorine poisoning, they had to be shot. The serious nature of fluoride toxicity was beginning to be realized. As a result, fluoride's threat to corporate America was laid out in an exhaustive review conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Toxicologist Floyd Dietz warned of new medical information exposing fluoride's harmful effects. Danish scientist Kaj Roholm singled out the aluminum industry, specifically Alcoa, as the source of much of the fluoride poisoning. Fluoride was causing irreparable damage and the word was getting out. Alcoa knew they had to act fast. Their high-powered attorneys sprung into action, quickly buying up farms and paying out settlements. Ironically enough, during that time, the U.S. Public Health Service was under the jurisdiction of the United States Treasury Secretary, Andrew W. Mellon. Mellon was the founder and major stockholder of Alcoa. He was also the founder of the Mellon Institute, an industry-funded research institute that was notorious for giving corporations, such as Alcoa, the scientific data they needed to defend themselves against lawsuits. The Mellon Institute published questionable and self-serving evidence that supported the effectiveness of fluoride in fighting tooth decay. In doing so, the Mellon Institute rats had put a smiling face on what had been a scientifically recognized environmental and workplace poison. It was an aluminum industry-funded scientist, Dr. Gerald Cox, who worked at the Mellon Institute that first made the proposal to artificially fluoridate public water supplies. Mellon's economic interest in fluoridation was obvious. Fluoridation provided the chemical industry an opportunity to void liability of their poisonous fluoride waste by means of promoting it as a health benefit. The official human experiments began in Grand Rapids, Michigan on January 25, 1945. 107 barrels of sodium fluoride were delivered to Grand Rapids, where city technicians began tipping them into the city's water supply. They were the first to publicly fluoridate their water. It was to serve as the test city, and its tooth decay rates were to be compared with those of non-fluoridated Muskegon. The study only lasted five years. There are no permanent teeth in the child born at the beginning of the study. It was an unblinded study. They did no measure of safety and they claimed that there was a tremendous benefit to the permanent teeth. Well, there weren't any permanent teeth in the children that were born at the beginning of the study. And soon thereafter, they fluoridated Muskegon, the control city. It's a phony baloney study used to demonstrate the benefits where there are none. Unfortunately, fluoride's ugly side has almost entirely escaped the public view. As Bryson points out, Historians have failed to record that fluoride pollution was in fact the biggest legal worry of the industries that were involved in developing the atomic bomb program. As some may remember, the Manhattan Project was a secret program which brought the atomic bomb into existence. But what most people are totally unaware of is the fact that fluoride was an essential element in the production of the atom bomb. It was a guy named Harold Hodge that was the chief toxicologist for the Manhattan Project and basically in order to create the nuclear weapons they needed massive massive amounts of fluoride. He was hired as a toxicologist or part of the team to determine is there going to be any toxic effects of fluoride in this project. Really what they were worried about is they were worried about lawsuits. They knew that there was negative effects of fluoride. They had to basically invent this whole scheme so they could use the high levels of fluoride in the Manhattan Project to create atomic and nuclear weapons. For more than 70 years, the Public Health Service has assured society that fluoridation is safe and effective. These assurances have largely rested on the results of the 1945 Newburgh Kingston Fluoride Carries Trial. This study compared the safety of fluoride in drinking water for two New York cities. One fluoridated, the other not fluoridated. The impetus for the first fluoridated city, Grand Rapids, was born from this study. However, recently declassified documents show that this study was a complete fabrication. A trail of declassified Manhattan Project papers unearthed by investigative journalist Christopher Bryson show that the toxicology department at the University of Rochester, which was under the direction of Harold Hodge, secretly monitored the Newburgh experiment to, quote, 
supply evidence useful in the litigation arising from an alleged loss of a fruit crop. In fact, these once restricted documents reveal that as far back as 1944, the Manhattan Project was spending money on toxicology studies on fluoride. Why? Because fluoride was the key ingredient used in the process of enriching uranium. Enriched uranium was the linchpin of the U.S. military's fledgling nuclear weapons program. Fluoride became a national security issue. The declassified documents suggest that Newberg was simply another human experiment, one used to justify the interests and advancement of the nuclear industrial state. The final report of Newberg concluded that small concentrations of fluoride were safe. Yet documents reveal that the top fluoride scientist in the U.S., Dr. H. Trendley Dean, known as the father of fluoridation, secretly opposed the experiment, fearing that fluoride's toxicity would be revealed. Until now, Dean's dissent on Newberg has never been made public. There's irrefutable evidence that the U.S. military the Manhattan Project, the makers of the atomic bomb, concealed evidence of fluoride's harm to their workers, to the community, and to the American public. One study was published in the journal of the American Dental Association in 1948 by Dale. In these files, Manhattan Project Captain Peter Dale at the University of Rochester reported preliminary results of dental investigations among laboratory fluoride workers at Columbia University. He concluded that fluoride did not prevent cavities in the 95 laboratory workers examined. Quote, their teeth seemed to be deteriorating rapidly, and their gums bled more freely. In fact, most of the hydrofluoric acid workers examined had few or no teeth left. They were in large part toothless or nearly toothless. This information, however, was left out of the published version. The published study merely notes that the fluoride workers had fewer cavities than did the unexposed workers. They didn't mention the fact that they had fewer cavities because their teeth had fallen out of their mouths. Since World War II, fluoride has been one of the most destructive environmental pollutants. At one point during the Cold War, fluoride was blamed for more damage claims against industry than all 20 other major air pollutants combined. Fluoride was responsible for one of the most notorious environmental disasters in U.S. history, the town of Donora, Pennsylvania which jump-started the environmental movement. In 1948, the small mill town lost 20 people, and an estimated 6,000 men, women, and children were sickened by U.S. Steel's dark blanketing smog. Even the town's name betrayed its corporate roots. Donora was an amalgam of the first name of Nora Mellon, the wife of industrialist Andrew W. Mellon. After the Halloween disaster in Donora, Pennsylvania, Philip Stadler, a chemist, went to Donora, and he was able to test and measure and prove that it was fluoride that had caused all those deaths. Sadler quickly went public. Article after article ran the story. Chemist says fluorine gas caused 19 smog deaths. Sadler said, chronic fluorine poisoning has been killing people in Donora for a long time. It has left its characteristic trademark on the valley's animals, crops, and vegetation. Both the U.S. Army and the Atomic Energy Commission now known as the Energy Department, had a secret and vital interest in the outcome of the Donora disaster. If fluoride were fingered for the Donora deaths, it might bring unwanted scrutiny of worker health safety for those in the bomb factories, resulting in damage suits and expensive requirements for air pollution controls. On October 1949, the Public Health Service official report on Donora was released. The 173-page government document appeared to be of similar size to that of the Holy Bible and came to virtually no conclusions. The report's emphasis was on bad weather and that the disaster was therefore an act of God. The report made no mention of fluoride. Could it be there was a vested interest on the part of the government not to upset the public concerning the potential dangers of fluoride? Although it was Gerald Cox's idea that ultimately led to the endorsement of water fluoridation, the man who gave the official endorsement was Federal Security Administrator Oscar R. Ewing, Alcoa's top Wall Street attorney. Nine months after the Donora disaster, Ewing made a surprise announcement for the nation. The U.S. Public Health Service was reversing a long-held position. The ex-Alcoa lawyer declared that his agency now favored adding fluoride to drinking water across the United States. Coincidence?
When it came time to choose a public relations representative to persuade public opinion in favor of water fluoridation, Ewing chose none other than the father of public relations himself, Edward Bernays. When they're selling water fluoridation, they didn't just walk out and say it's good for you. They actually hired Edward Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, to sell Americans on how good it was to have silicone fluoride in the water. Edward Bernays was the one that created how to control the population through media and through advertising. Edward Bernays, also known as the father of spin, pioneered the idea of crowd psychology. In 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda, in which he wrote, if we understand the mechanism and motives of the group mind, is it not possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without their knowing it? He called it the engineering of consent. Bernays introduced the corporate giants to crowd psychology methods and polished techniques to manipulate society. He convinced the population to buy on impulse things they didn't even need. In his writings, he concluded that individuals were controlled by four basic motivations, self-preservation, aggression, security, and sex. Bernays' belief was that by appealing to any of these four motives, it was possible to manipulate the majority of a population into doing almost anything. You could brainwash them into smoking cigarettes, starting war, electing politicians, you name it. And given the proven effectiveness of these techniques, it was no coincidence that the Aluminum Company of America asked Bernays to head the campaign for the fluoridation of the United States water supply. People like Bernays, you know, were masters of social engineering. His entire thesis, if you will, is that you don't talk to the public in a rational, scientific way. Instead, you appeal to their emotions and you invoke their fears. He was key in getting women to start smoking. He positioned cigarettes as being sexy and individualistic and, you know, power to the woman. That was the, the framing of why women should start smoking. A consumerist culture was born, and the United States government took notice. U.S. agencies soon adopted Bernays' techniques of manipulation to manufacture the fear of ever-present danger in the minds of the people, to give those in power greater control of what Bernays called the mass mind. He went on to propose in his book Propaganda, those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This statement holds just as true today as it did in the 20s when Bernays first wrote it. Throughout medical science, including dentistry, poison-producing corporations have always been able to infiltrate major institutions and dominate their narrative. When Christopher Bryson was writing this book, The Fluoride Deception, he reached out to Edward Bernays. Bernays said it was child's play to convince the American public that fluoride was good for them. While the official narrative rang, the case for fluoride had been proven. Some people weren't so quick to jump on the fluoridation bandwagon. Because fluoride had been used for years as a rat poison to kill coyotes, to kill cockroaches. Some of those opposing fluoridation were in fact dentists. And because of their advocacy for safe water, they were censored by the American Dental Association. If they worked for the public health service, they got fired. If they were team players and kept their mouth shut, they got to keep their job. So out of fear, many people who knew better remained silent. The true story behind water fluoridation can be hard to swallow. The facelift performed on fluoride dating back more than 60 years ago has misled generations. Instead of conjuring up the image of a crippled worker or a poisoned forest, we see smiling children. As a new generation arises, we must sound the alarm yet again. To those who have ears to hear, this film is meant to be a warning. This film will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that fluoride is a deadly poison being added to our water supply. It will further prove that the chemical commonly known as fluoride is the only chemical added to public drinking water to treat you, the individual, rather than the water. The information presented in this film can change your life. It can help protect your health and the health of your loved ones. 
It will lay out the real facts behind water fluoridation. It will expose the hidden hand behind the curtain, pulling the levers of industry, corporate profit, and public perception. Fluoridation is neither safe nor effective, but rather a fraud. And honestly, one of the biggest hoaxes ever perpetrated in human history. To say things like, tobacco is harmless, fluoride is harmless. Agent Orange is harmless, they say. DDT was harmless. Asbestos, right? Yeah, GMOs now, they say, are harmless. This is a long history of science selling out to corporate interests while the people are systematically poisoned. And to this day, people still believe fluoride is safe in the drinking water, and the majority of dentists still believe it's safe to put in toothpaste and to put in uh, different types of compounds. Most people in America are persuaded that everybody fluoridates their water. And, you, and if you're living in a town like Albany or Long Island or Ithaca or somewhere, but the vast majority of the population in the world does not drink fluoridated water. Most of the countries do not fluoridate their water, only about 30. The countries now that have banned the use of fluoride, uh, China, Austria, Belgium, Finland, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Hungary, and Japan. These, all these countries have said that fluoride, number one, is ineffective and toxic and should not be used. We are still using it. There's something wrong here. I think it's time that uh, we become aware and do something about it. How come our country that's supposed to be, quote, so smart, uses it. Well, there's something going on here. What does the European Union know that we don't know? Nothing. Nothing. They know the same thing, that's why. But the difference is they're not getting paid off and we are. And so therefore, this is what the only thing I can come up with because they both have the same facts. They both have the same facts. Fluoride is toxic. Fluoride is not helping your teeth. If it was really helping your teeth, why do we have all these dental problems? It's not at all. How come you can go to primitive societies around the world that never had or even seen fluoride and they have perfect teeth? Why are we having all these learning disorders? How come we're having autism? We're having all these things we never had before. Well, why don't we ask that question and answer it honestly? Answer it honestly. 98% of Europe does not fluoridate. Only eight countries in the world have more than 50% of their population drinking water. America, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Israel, Singapore, Malaysia, and Colombia. Only eight. I think Europeans have come to their senses on, on several issues, not all of them, but on many. GMOs being one of them and fluoride being another. They've rejected these things because they're looking at the evidence. America tends to be way behind the curve on really recognizing reality in the realm of, of fraudulent hoax science. Our CDC and the liars in Washington, D.C. have only had success in countries that speak English for the vast majority of the disposal of their hazardous waste product. That means that you and I and our children in the United States are the largest consumers of hydrofluosilicic acid. Call it what it is, hydrofluosilicic acid. What is that? Hydro is water, fluo, fluoride, silicic, sand, and it's missing an electron, it's acidic. It'll kill you. You take your hand dipping in like that, and you're gonna die. Hydrofluosilicic acid does not occur in nature. It's a man-made molecule. And it eats through concrete, glass, stainless steel, fiberglass, plastic. You name it, it'll eat it. So why are we putting that in the water? First tonight, hazmat crews from all across our area responded to a chemical leak this afternoon in Rock Island. The chemical was so strong that it was burning through the concrete there. News 8's Christy Mergenthal has the latest. It was just before 1 o'clock Thursday afternoon when hazmat crews were called to the Rock Island water treatment plant for a chemical spill coming from this tanker truck. The chemical hydrofluoro sicilic acid is used to add fluoride to the plant's water. After several hours, crews were able to clean up the leak, allowing operations to return to normal. They had to coordinate 
cutting off the area, obviously, but as far as uh, the treatment of the water and the, the amount of water uh, you know, being used by the public, there's no effect on that at all. Now that acid that did spill out is a chemical that they actually use every single day here at the water treatment plant. It adds fluoride to the water. Reporting live in Rock Island, Christy Mergenthal, WQAD Quad Cities News 8. That's how they transport it. It's, it's, it's extremely aggressive. It'll, it'll eat through almost anything, including concrete. What is labeled fluoride is not naturally occurring fluoride like you might find in the ground. It's actually a collection. It can be over a hundred different chemicals, including some radioactive chemicals, including many cancer-causing chemicals, including heavy metals, uh, neurologically damaging elements that are called fluoride. And then this is dumped into the water supply and the cities have the doctors and dentists convinced that this is somehow good for your teeth. Fluoride is really a clever way for industry, the mining industry, the chemical processing industries, aluminum smelting and processing industries, to eliminate their toxic industrial waste without having to pay for it to be handled as industrial waste. They just slap a new label on it, fluoride. They sell it to cities and the cities dump it into the water supply. Basically is a hazardous waste byproduct of the manufacture of phosphate fertilizer. It's a mining byproduct. They dig up this rock. This rock is no good, as is. So you mix it with sulfuric acid, and this produces soluble phosphate. And that's what becomes the fertilizer. It's a byproduct that they can't do anything with. It's a poison. So they sell it and make fluoride out of it. It was a fraud. It was a scam from the get-go. It is a means of getting rid of fluoride. You allow industry to use your water supply to dispose of their hazardous waste. It's a disposal mechanism. It's an industrial, a major industrial waste pollutant. They were trying to dump it into the rivers that were going out into the ocean in Florida, and boy, they stopped that. They said, you're polluting, you're killing the fish, you're, and which they were. For a hundred years, they decimated the local vegetation, crippled the cattle, damaged the citrus groves in Florida. It was costing them a fortune to handle this as a very serious industrial waste. And so they're helping Cargill get rid of their hazardous waste problems. Cargill is the largest privately owned corporation in the world. They were also the largest producer of hydrofluosilicic acid. Cargill at one time had like 90% of the market. When the hurricanes went through Florida, they knocked out the holding pond, so there was a shortage of hydrofluosilicic acid. And so they reached out to the rest of the world, and now we get it from Mexico and Japan and China, because none of those countries allow fluoride in the water supply. They don't, they don't put it in at all, so it obviously it's piling up in those countries. I don't think we need to be helping other countries out with their disposal of fluorosilicic acid. Fluoridation is the worst recycling practice in the world, so I support recycling. But to take the hazardous waste from the phosphate fertilizer industry, which cannot be dumped into the sea by international law and cannot be used locally because it's too concentrated. And to take that product and put it into our public drinking water is sheer lunacy. It's bizarre. I mean, George Orwell Kafka could have written this play. It's, it's, it's lunacy. There are 250,000 tons dumped annually in the water supply. Does that sound like a big figure to you? If you had one ton and were worth over a million dollars, you'd be a poor person by the time you got rid of that ton. It's extremely expensive to get rid of. Is there anybody that you know that might be willing to talk to us, perhaps a whistleblower, somebody who's been injured or? Yeah, I mean, there's a guy who wrote a book, uh, Toxic Torts, uh, the tell-all book about the phosphate fertilizer industry, Gary Pittman. He'll, he'll tell you the story. Is that where he out of? In Florida. That's where the, all the phosphate mines are in the United States. That's right. Paul, looks like we're going to Florida, buddy. When I first started working at the Occidental Chemical Corporation's chemical plants in the early 1970s, there was no safety program in place. The only equipment you had to wear was a hard hat and safety glasses. And uh, we didn't wear the safety glasses half the time because it wasn't enforced. The environment was very dirty. The air was filled with dust and toxic fumes. 
We worked eight, 12 hours a day, sometimes longer, sometimes double shifts in those conditions. When you're 18, you think you're invincible. I had a physical by their doctor and he actually put on my application a perfect health specimen. Mistakenly, you tend to believe that somehow you're invincible and blindly step into harm's way without a thought about the future consequences. I started working there when I was 18. I was in excellent health. I quickly rose to a supervisory position and was making about $50,000 a year. However, my success came at a high price, my health and well-being. My first and last job was working for Occidental Chemical Company in the phosphoric acid plants in Hamilton County, Florida. So Gary, what made you write this book? I wanted to leave a history behind on what happened to me and some of the co-workers here in this county. And it kind of gives the inside look at a phosphate plant, mainly the chemical plant where phosphoric acid is made. Former employees of Occidental Chemical Corporation have filed a lawsuit against the company. They say they have life-threatening diseases because the company did not follow safety procedures. Paige, they have diseases like leukemia, emphysema, and toxic brain syndrome. For years, doctors struggled to diagnose them, but finally they found a common link. It was the phosphate plant they all worked for. Gary and several other former employees are suing Occidental for failing to provide adequate safety education and gear. One woman's husband died of bone cancer before his battle could make it to court. They messed up my life. They messed up everybody's life and they're continuing to mess up other people's lives. They need to come in and realize and to admit to what they are doing. When Gary Pittman filed a lawsuit against Occidental Chemical Company, he knew what he was getting into. Occidental was a mammoth organization and no stranger to litigation. It was Occidental that had been responsible for one of the most horrendous environmental tragedies in American history, the Love Canal. President Carter declared a state of emergency today in the Love Canal area of New York's Niagara Falls where toxic chemicals were discovered oozing from the ground. My three kids were born with birth defects. My wife's had cancer. This was a site that literally is best described, orange goop, toxic soup uh, is what it has been referred to. You had 80 different chemicals. I mean, some very bad stuff was in these people's backyards, was literally seeping into their basements. Health officials are urging more families to move, but that's not as simple as it seems. Between the years of 1947 and 1953, the Hooker Chemical Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Occidental Chemical, used the Love Canal section of Niagara Falls as a dumping site for toxic waste. Today we write the final chapter of the environmental disaster called Love Canal. In doing so, we make clear that when people make a mess of our environment, they should and they will be held responsible for cleaning up their mess. The EPA concluded that Occidental dumped millions of tons of hazardous chemicals and then sold the property to the Niagara Falls School District for one dollar. In papers to be filed in court in Buffalo this afternoon, the Occidental Chemical Corporation will agree to pay 129 million dollars. In the end, Occidental was out of pocket a total of $200 million for damages and settlements, not including court costs and the millions they spent defending themselves. These kind of dangers no longer will be tolerated by the American public. The day of discarding hazardous materials indiscriminately and haphazardly is over. There must never be in our country another Love Canal. Thank you very much. But in reality, this $200 million spanking to a multi-billion dollar a year company is far less severe than a parking ticket to the average person. Occidental had a pattern of disregard for environmental issues. In the summer of 1979, the New York Times reported that Hooker's plant in White Springs, Florida was convicted of polluting the air with fluoride. Even more damning were the copies of corporate memorandums passed among Hooker executives in which it was revealed that Hooker's top echelon knew and approved of the pollution violations. Finally, Hooker company officials admitted to accidentally poisoning local water supplies not only at the New York location, but at their Michigan and California plants. The White Springs plant that Gary Pittman worked for not only was polluting the air with fluoride, but had also dumped tons of waste on their own property. 
in a leaked inner office memo obtained by an insider at Occidental's White Springs plant, reveals 25 different waste disposal sites buried on the property. This highly classified document lists the hazardous, carcinogenic, highly fluoridated toxins that are all buried on the site and are still there today. Gary Pittman knew that he was about to embark into a David versus Goliath scenario. Occidental was not to be trusted. They had been known to buy and intimidate officials. They provided financial support to the campaigns of certain political candidates and owned judges. Gary had only 12 lawyers against Occidental's prestigious law firm, Holland and Knight, which at the time consisted of 540 of the nation's top lawyers. However, to his benefit, Gary had the documents to prove his case. He also had a stellar record within the company and was known as a company man. He was a loyal and hardworking employee. The last thing he had ever imagined doing was to sue the very company that had provided him such a good life. In spite of this, Gary felt as though he had no choice. He was sick and couldn't work. So Gary named a price that could make him go away, and Occidental accepted. In the end, Gary settled out of court with Occidental, but his health problems still linger. The phosphate industry is one of the biggest industries in Florida. It brings in billions of dollars each year in profits. Television ads and billboards often portray strip mining as a wholesome industry that creates jobs and feeds the world. However, a closer look reveals the extreme toxicity to our environment and health. Paul, I think what you need to do is get some aerial shots of that plant. because you cannot see the devastation going on from just riding down the road. If you could get some aerial shots of that plant, I could point out what's going on, what's happening, you know, and, 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 and point out where a lot of the pollution's going on and stuff like that. What people don't realize is this is where hydrofluorosilicic acid starts because you have to mine the rock, you have to make the phosphoric acid, and hydrofluorosilicic acid is made from the fumes off the phosphoric acid. Then it's put into the city's drinking water. I worked out there my whole life, basically, and uh, I never seen that, that good of shots. You don't see this on Google Earth. I mean, you just see an overview, and you get the idea that they, those are there, but... Yeah, what you see here is, you know, the common person never sees this. They don't. They don't really want you to see it either because then you would know how much devastation, you know, there is at these plants. So you know what's so good about it is, is the general public's going to get to see this in this new film and they can, you know, they can decide, you know. And like I said, that's where your hydrofluorosilicic acid starts. That's the way they mine. It's overburdened. They take, over the, take the overburden off to get to the ore. Basically, they take a nice forest area, they cut down all the trees, they burn all the stumps, and they take all the topsoil off. The overburden is topsoil, subsoil, clays, until mm. they get to the ore. This right here is just, they've already dug it all out. Yeah, yeah, they've mined this, and as you can see, you can see the forest in the background and you can see the, the huge chunk of land that they have mined. The phosphate lobby is very, very powerful. You know, it's just a, it's a sad situation. It's devastating to the earth. This water, this coffee-colored water, it's just hard to describe how bad it is. You know, when you call it water, it's not really water. It's so, it's so laden with so many different chemicals, and it contains many elements such as cadmium, chromium, mercury, nickel, beryllium, arsenic, uh, fluorides, lots of fluorides. Lead, and I heard it even has, like, it has radioactive elements it in is, it, It is, it is radioactive. Uranium-238, radium-226, it also has traces of polonium-210, uh, 
uh, very contaminated stuff. A lot of people don't realize that this is some of the worst contamination at a phosphoric acid chemical plant. Where this was all located is uh, was wetlands. If you have a wetland, you'll have a heck of a time trying to get a permit to go into a wetland, you know, to do anything. You know, if you want to dig a pond or whatever, they're not going to give you a permit. But somehow these people got permits to dig up all this wetland and uh, they claim they'll reclaim it, but, but it'll never be reclaimed like it once was. It's just, there, there's no way. They will reclaim just enough land and they'll have a little show place so visitors and they can go show them what they've been doing. Yeah, we've mined this out and now this is what, what we've done. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, for what they've uh, destroyed out there, you know, uh, what, a, a 10 or 15 or 20 acre plot they've reclaimed, Nah, they're not gonna. They're not gonna reclaim it. What they'll eventually do, and this is just my prediction, is uh, they'll change the name of this place and they'll form a corporation and they'll call it something like White Springs Phosphate. And then when they finish mining out the rock, they'll bankrupt. Up here on the right, we're going to have the administration offices. They used to be in the chemical plant, and they moved them. <laughs> they used to eat the pantyhose off the women's legs. Wow. It says, to whom it may concern, I worked at the above-named company, Occidental Chemical Company, White Springs, Florida, in 1968 and part of 1969. Our accounting department was located in the admin building, which at that time was located at the chemical plant. Many mornings when we employees would get out of our vehicles, women, our pantyhose would dissolve off of our legs. It was explained to us that it was a chemical fallout, not to worry. Our boss would see that each of us girls would get one dollar to get us another pair of pantyhose. The chemicals also would eat small pit holes in the paint on our vehicles. Years later, they moved the admin building away from the chemical plant to out by the main road. And uh, there's several more names here of other girls that could uh, testify to this. So there's three things you can see from the space station, and that's the Great Pyramids of Egypt, the Phosphogypsum stacks of Florida, and the Great Wall of China. And that's how large they are. They, they have them in South Florida and Central Florida that are 400 acres big. It's a huge operation. They dig cubic tons of, 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 of rock a day. What, what is the, what, what the water up, on, up there? The pond water is water they use for the process and it's recycled. The water is used over and over and it gets stronger and stronger and more contaminated. How do they contain it? Just by building a dam like a that? A dam around it, and that, that's what I was fixing to tell you. There's no liner under that stack. It's right on top of the ground, and it is leaching. Sure it is. Through the groundwater. Yeah, what, I, I read somewhere about a sinkhole that took place. The reason the sinkhole developed is because of the acidic water eating away the limestone. And once the limestone gives way, you're in the groundwater. Wow. Because in Florida, when you drill a well, you have to go through the limestone to get to the air. Sure. When that 84 million, million gallons fell through in there, it contaminated all this water around. It had to have. Like I said, you know, it's just a matter of time before, you know, you have a sinkhole like that. It's just a weak point. Wherever there's a weak point in a cavity in the limestone is where the ground eventually, bottom falls. Eventually going to happen. Yeah, in all of them. In all of them. It's just a massive, massive operation. Yes, it is, and if you'll see there's sections in this phosphogypsum stack. Mm -hmm. When the sinkhole caved in, in one of these, it was one of these sections. It wasn't all of it. Only that one section was 87 million gallons. Whoa. So you can, you can multiply that times four. You know, that's just a lot of toxic waste to be going into the aquifer. In addition to this recycled toxic water up there in those in those ponds, those ponds you call them, 
uh, they're, in addition to that, they're taking fresh water too, right? Of course, they use a lot of fresh water because see, this is the main thing that they don't want you to know, is what they call the water balance. It just makes them nervous if you start talking about the water balance. What do they add back when they need water if it's leaching? Right. It's going away, so right. they have to add some fresh water I see. to keep the process going. Right. The phosphate industry uses more fresh water than any other industry in the state of Florida. You know, when, and sometimes they have to release water out of those toxic ponds. And what do they put it? They put it in the creeks and it runs into the Suwannee River. Now what they do to it is lime it to bring the pH up so it don't kill the fish immediately. The Suwannee River, they claim, is a pristine waterway. But if you ask the Fresh and Game Water Commission in Florida, They'll tell you not to eat over one fish out of that river a month. Wow. Because of lead and mercury and chromium and cadmium. They won't tell you that, but that's why. Yeah, that's why. This is just a lot of the documentation I've reached through the years. What really caught my eye was like we had talked about earlier, the 1972 through 1979 misrepresenting environmental data. And they charged them $575,000 for emitting 10 times the amount of fluoride allowed below. And I was working there when that was going on and the fumes were just unbelievable. It pit the, the glass on your windshields, make them so foggy it would etch the glass. Just having your car parked out there while you're at work. Parked. I mean, back in the 60s, you know, they, they, I mean, even earlier they realized that those fumes were very Strange. toxic. Very toxic. The phosphate company pretty much polices themselves. They have their own crews do their stack testing and, and, and all the other environmental things. And, you know, that's kind of like the fox watching the hen house. And I have been involved where they would go up to test the stack and come down and tell me, so something's wrong. This stack is going to fail. You know, so you look around, find a problem, straighten it out, and say, okay, boys, y'all can go up there and test now. I have also been at the point to where we couldn't find what was wrong and they were doing the test and we would just go and open a blind in the fume ducts to allow more fresh air to rush in so it would dilute the emissions. But I know for a fact that they cheat on these tests. Once you know that, then you lose all faith in these regulatory agencies and they just because you know it's all a farce. In this past I'd say six months, there's been four people that I know of that I grew up with. They were younger than me. They were 52, all of them died. I do honestly believe it has something to do with the, the phosphate. phosphate chemical plants out there. I would imagine you've seen some injured employees. I've seen people burned. I've seen people blown up. Uh, I saw a man killed, and he was going to weld on a rotary drum filter. Somebody had washed it with a solution of sulfuric acid and pond water. Found out later the guy had struck an arc to weld on that thing and it exploded. And it killed him, messed up his friend too that was helping. But yeah, it's a very hazardous work environment. When you digest phosphate rock with sulfuric acid, that's what you're going to give off, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. Now even at that strength, it'll eat up concrete, asphalt, stainless steel, even the fume ducts after a while, which is made out of fiberglass. Very corrosive, the most corrosive acid known to man. Used to etch glass, it's used for a lot of things. Uh, one of the things it's used for is to fluoridate drinking water. Who in the world would want to drink water with this stuff in it? The city of Dallas, Texas, like many cities across the nation, spends millions of dollars on contracts with companies like Cargill, Mosaic, and Penco to fluoridate the region's water supply. On Mosaic's website, the product listed for use in water fluoridation is actually called hydrofluorosilicic acid. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, otherwise known as OSHA, is a U.S. agency that requires companies to produce a material safety data sheet, or an MSDS, for every chemical product in the market. The MSDS that Mosaic produces for their fluoride product will make your hair stand on end. 
Right here I have the Mosaic material safety data sheet on their hydrofluorosilicic acid product. A material safety data sheet is a very important document to disclose safety and health issues about possible exposure to this chemical. The MSDA sheet is supposed to inform you about what is this chemical, what's in it. So what we find in the case of the Mosaic, their hydrofluorosilicic acid, is that it is not a pharmaceutical grade product. It is an industrial grade chemical. And under section two, hazard identification, it identifies a health hazard as being corrosive to the skin, the eyes, and the mucous membranes. If you come in contact with it uh, through the skin or inhalation or ingestion, uh, such as swallowing it, it may cause severe irritation and burns. And so on the second page, it identifies potential health effects and it mentions that it's corrosive to the eye, uh, corrosive to the skin, corrosive uh, uh, through inhalation, such as breathing, corrosive if you swallow it, in this, they're, they're basically giving these health effects due to hydrofluorosilicic acid and a high concentration. It's less clear at, at what concentration this won't happen at. As a chemist, I've looked at scores of material safety data sheets and never in my career have I seen a warning for children in an MSDS, material safety data sheet. What happens is, the companies that's producing this chemical realizes they have a revenue stream that's a little risky for them from a liability standpoint on how their customers are using this chemical. And so they've now put a warning in their material safety data sheet, warning um, for fluorosis, osteosclerosis, if exposure occurs during enamel formation. There are no children working in these chemical plants. There's no, there are no children being chemical handlers. So this warning is for the end user. And so we've presented this to the city council and they have now been alerted that their own supplier has put a warning. And this is where we came across and said, you now need to put a warning, at least for children that you've received from your supplier, you need to put that downstream. So now the liability is on them too. Hydrofluorosilicic acid has no known benefit in human or any physiological system. It's not even useful in any mammal. So adding that to the public water supply for an alleged benefit is a fraud and it's a crime against the citizens of this country and it's cumulative over a lifetime. It is a very noxious poison and you do not have to take my word for it. If you've got a Webster's Dictionary, open it up. It, one of the definitions is fluoride, a violent protoplasmic poison. Then you have to go look up protoplasm. We are protoplasm. So. Violent protoplasm for us. Say, let's put that in the water and see how the kids turn out. Oh, well, you know, as we're learning, there it seems like there are no rewards to this. It just seems, it's just all risks. It's all risk. It's a big lie. There's no benefit whatsoever. It's all risk. Let's get to the science. That's what I say. Instead of covering it up, let's look at the science. What do these fluoride chemicals actually do to human beings? There's all kinds of research out there showing it really disturbs the functioning of the body in a number of ways. Uh, inactivates 62 enzymes, increases the aging process, increases the incidence of cancers and tumors up to 17%, disrupts the immune system, causes genetic damage, interrupts RNA and DNA, repair enzymes activity, increases arthritis, and it's a system poison. These are all validated by scientific data. We have in America today all of the symptoms of hypothyroidism, uh, obesity, heart disease, neurological impairment. I have been very sick. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism about 10 years ago. There was no family history in my background that explained why I had this thyroid illness. What were some of your side effects? Feeling very cold. Um, hair loss, uh, concentration issues. It really controls your metabolism. So I, was, I had gained about 10 to 15 pounds, which is very unusual. I was very athletic my whole life and never was overweight. So I gained weight. I was sleeping a lot. Again, your metabolism is tuned down. Doing the research, fluoride is an uh, irritant to your thyroid. Your thyroid wants iodine. And if it doesn't get 
iodine at the concentrations that it needs, then it gets whatever is closest that you're providing in the environment. And if you look at the periodic table, you see that fluoride, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all in the same column. That means they have very similar electronic structure and reactivity. So that's why your thyroid will uptake fluoride and chlorine when you're not giving it enough iodine. It's, it's a gradual accumulation of the fluorides and the, and the other things you're exposed to out there that just gradually wears on you through the years. And that's one reason it's hard to pinpoint a health problem because you know you work out there six seven eight ten years before you start noticing things and then it's almost too late then because it's already done the damage but i've been real weak and just lethargic yeah so when the blood work come back the guy asked me he said what have you been doing i said uh, nothing the last few days i've been laying on the couch at home you know i ain't felt well he said you sure you hadn't fell off of a building or something? He said, look, he said, you have a muscle destructive process going on. That was exactly what he told me. And I said, what, 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 is, what does that mean? He said, you got a muscle destructive process going on and there's nothing I can do to help you. One of the key questions is, if you run the world and you don't want competition, how do you shut down people's consciousness? How do you do that? Well, you put poisons, effectively, into the water supply that compromise these gateways of consciousness. And fluoride is one of the most powerful poisons that is routinely used for this purpose. The pineal gland is actually kind of located in the center of the brain, and it secretes two hormones, DMT and melatonin. Melatonin actually regulates your sleep cycles and it's kind of like a feel-good hormone which also helps regulate your puberty and it helps regulate all your hormone structures inside your system. The pineal gland to me is so important because it's been regarded as like the third eye and even in, in Egyptian times they call it the eye of Horus. They call it the pineal gland because it kind of resembles a pine cone. And if you look at the staff that the Pope has, it has a pine cone on it. And if you look at statues throughout the Vatican and throughout history, you'll see the shape of a pine cone and you'll see symbols showing the importance of the pineal gland. Now the pineal gland is also regarded in some religions as the seat of the soul or it's your gateway or your connection to God. If you know that the pineal gland is the consciousness of the human, and that could be your connection with God, why not take it out? And the fastest and easiest way to take out the pineal gland and to calcify the pineal gland would be with fluoride because fluoride has an affinity for those areas in the body that produce calcium hydroxyapatite. Today in the United States, children are reaching puberty much earlier in age than they did in the past. Some evidence indicates that fluoride, via its effect on the pineal gland, could be a contributing cause to this trend. In 1997, Jennifer Luke published her PhD thesis on fluoride in the pineal gland. In her dissertation, she conducted animal studies and concluded that fluoride exposure has been found to cause early puberty in females. Similar findings have been reported in two epidemiological studies of human populations that are drinking fluoridated water. The first study was conducted in 1945 during the Newburgh versus Kingston fluoridation trial. It was discovered that girls in fluoridated Newburgh were reaching menstruation on average five months earlier than the girls in unfluoridated Kingston. But the result was not thought to be significant at the time. In 1983, another study was conducted in which a man with the last name of Farkas reported that girls living in highly fluoridated towns began their first menstruation cycles at a much younger age than girls living in less fluoridated areas. When the pineal gland is calcified, it causes an onset of puberty. In my documentary, Crippling Waters, one of the ladies in there, we called her the star, a nine-year-old girl, take a look at her. Does she look nine? She's exposed to high fluoride in her family's well water. Her dad, who's only 20 years older, is starting to bend over like this and starting to become crippled. He can't put his hands above his head. 
the calcification of the pineal gland is an adaptive process so that that child can have babies by the time she's 14 because she's going to be crippled by the time she's 40. Fluoride's role in earlier puberty needs more thorough investigation. When one considers the seriousness of a possible interference by fluoride on a growing child's pineal gland, it underlines the negative and dangerous effects of fluoridation. Dave, so what we're learning is kind of frightening because it seems to me that once it's in your body, it's, is it there to stay? Yes, you can't get it out. You can cut some of the harm by mitigating the damage and avoid it like the plague, but you really can't get it out because it's stuck in your bones. And that's why you have all the skeletal symptoms, you know, the, the joint pain, the arthritis and all that stuff. The first signs that fluoride is poisoning your bones is pains in the joints, stiffness in the joints, pains in the bones. Well, you go to the doctor with pain in a joint, he says, well, you got arthritis. Well, arthritis, arth, joint, rightist, pain. Oh, okay, joint pain. So we got somebody speaking to us in Latin. Oh, you got joint pain, super duper. We have millions of people with arthritis in the United States and in Florida countries, one in three adults. Nobody's ever looked to see if some of those arthritis cases may have been caused or exacerbated by fluoride. Just not looking. Are bones with more fluoride stronger? or less strong? And the answer is less strong. They got studies where they tried to give them a dose of fluoride, sodium fluoride, to cause an increase in bone mass. It did, but it weakened the bone itself. So those are case-controlled studies. That's the gold standard in medicine. So we have case-controlled studies showing that if you give people fluoride, it accumulates in their bones and it causes the bones to become white, opaque, increases the bone density, decreases the bone tensile strength. And they actually took a bone that was removed from people for the purpose of replacing a, a joint or a hip, put it in a little device here where you put a weight on there and snap it, and they showed that the more fluoride in the bone, the quicker it snaps. Do you ever wonder, how come everybody has hip replacements, knee replacements? I mean, you can go on and on. I can think back when I was a kid, it, that didn't happen. You didn't see all these crippled people. I mean, you saw a few, but it wasn't common. I mean, how does it end up in our bones? Is, is that where our body just finds? Yeah. It's calcium-rich tissue, so your body parks it there because right. it's got to dispose of it some way, otherwise it would kill you. So it parks at the bone, and then it kills your bones. What it does once it fills up with fluoride, that you get little spikes on the outside of the bone. If you take a a hand and take a bone and run your hand up and down a normal bone, it's slick. And that's because muscles move around on the bones when you're running or jogging or lifting weights and all that stuff. Your muscles are moving around on your bone and it's slick so it doesn't hurt. Well, if you make that bone the texture of sandpaper, then when the muscle moves around, the fascia tears and it hurts to move. And so fluoride accumulates in calcium rich tissues, which are bone, ligaments, cartilage, joints, and teeth. So you have to look at this as you, if you have a lifetime body burden and the, the less you're exposed to, the longer you can go before you develop symptoms. The first most irrefutable symptom of fluoride exposure is pain. And that's what we saw, my wife and I filmed a documentary in China. And pain was the hugely significant symptom that they all had, they couldn't even work. And, you know, in China, if you don't work, you starve to death. Have you ever heard of dental fluorosis? No. No. Okay. So it uh, comes when somebody's overexposed to fluoride. Awesome. That's a picture of very mild dental fluorosis. And so is that. You know, that young girl came to see me to get that fixed because she doesn't think that's beautiful. She thinks that looks bad when she smiles. And I think everybody else agrees with her. They say 41% of American teenagers have this condition. So this is the white spot, so it's been there. It's, it's a little scary, you know, knowing that many people, we don't even know, you know, what's in our water. Fluorosis can become more severe than a simple white spot. In severe cases, it can deform a patient's teeth. When you see spots on the teeth like this, that means you gave the child enough of a poison that the cells that were making that organ didn't make it right. They made it wrong. When I was a child, I was overexposed to fluoride. There are streaks of that in my teeth. So you learned that early on then? I knew, yes. Those teeth are very brittle, so I have cavities 
more frequently in those teeth than other ones that don't have the, the evidence of the fluorosis. Maybe you've seen it, it's white chalky spots on your teeth. And I was told that those are calcium buildups. From the fluoride. Okay. Right. I don't think I had really, really strong teeth to start with, but I did have some teeth that they just broke. The last time this happened, I was eating a baked potato and it broke two out. A baked and, uh, potato. A baked potato and it broke two out. Did you notice anybody else in the plant losing teeth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we talk about it a lot at the plant. So the ADA, the people in office, the people who are in these regulatory agencies, they're aware of overexposure to fluoride causes dental fluorosis, correct? Yeah. They, they know of that, right? And they know that dental fluorosis, the, the, the teeth become weakened, they chip, they fall out. Brown, spotted, ugly wear away real fast. Yes, they know all of that. We took California, we took the whole state. There's no difference in dental care costs for welfare from one end of the state to the other, regardless of the amount of fluoride in the water, whether it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, no difference. So if there was a tremendous benefit, you ought to be able to see that, and it doesn't show up at all in the computer data. So that's why they won't debate you. And although fluoride can help with your teeth, if either chemical is consumed in high amounts over a lifetime, it can lead to cancer, skin conditions, bone disease, and other health issues. There is a recent lawsuit in Maryland, it's a federal lawsuit, a woman who believed the medical establishment at the time when her daughter was an infant. She gave her daughter 90% of her diet intake of, of water was this fluoridated baby water. And so the daughter grew up with severe fluorosis and to get that corrected dental restoration is about $100,000 and they can't bear that burden. So they are suing Nestle and Gerber. So putting it in a baby bottle when the child doesn't have any visible teeth, there's no way on God's green earth that can have anything except a negative impact on that child. It will damage that baby's teeth. But they sell it in the grocery store as baby's first water. I've seen that for years. How do we educate women to not buy this for their babies? And this is why we wanted the warning for infants, because they're the most at risk. They drink their weight in water within two or three days. If you and I did that, we'd be drinking 22 liters a day. I mean, it just goes back to the whole of these regulatory agencies that are supposed to you know, be kind of looking out for our best interests. And as you know, they're not. There's no reason for the FDA to allow them to sell this as a food. It's a crime. I hope they're punished someday. I say they have a duty to warn. They have a duty to warn you. Not one manufacturer of formula says, by the way, don't use the tap water. Women, infant, and children, WIC program. We contacted them. They refused to tell mothers not to use the tap water. And you know what she said? It would damage the fluoridation program. Fluoride is safe and effective, and it's one of the most inexpensive ways to really cut down on dental decay. Fluoride is safe and effective. Fluoride is safe. Fluoride is safe and effective. Well, there's a study from 20 years ago showing infant mortality was higher in fluoridated communities. Is that why? I don't know. Why didn't they do a follow-up study? I think that would be interesting to know. Children have died, you know. There's been a case of a child who swallowed this, the dentist left the room, the parents didn't know, the kid swallowed it, had to be rushed to hospital, they couldn't save me, died. So yeah, it's very toxic substance. There's no question about that. Is that the kind of stuff that a responsible parent would be putting in their child's hand? FDA in 1997 required manufacturers of toothpaste to put this warning label on it. It's the same as you'd have on a loaded 38 caliber pistol. Keep out of reach of children and only use a little pea-sized amount, which is about the same amount that would be up in a bottle of water. And if that amount is swallowed, call the poison control center or seek professional help immediately. So if I drink a bottle of water, should I call the poison control center too? This is just insane. So this is what two different organizations say. One says, don't swallow it. Why did they put that on there? They put that on there because there were 10,000 calls a year to the poison control centers from children made ill by swallowed toothpaste. 10,000 calls, and you know for every call, there's five that didn't call. And so, and there are only poison control centers in half the states. So that means 100,000 children are made ill by swallowed toothpaste. It's insane to put a deadly poison in a child's hand and say, go brush and be sure and spit out, Johnny. 
Florida has been a slow process of introduction into the dental profession where it's commonplace for us to consider Florida as the thing to do to help decay. But well, we now know, statistics have shown us, that fluoride is not working, but it's very toxic to you and can cause everything from cancer to depression. So, yeah, it's a serious issue. You are meant to have the right to informed consent to medication. What we're doing in a Florida community is we're doing to everyone what a doctor can do to no one. A doctor says to you, he says, look, this glass of water is going to do wonderful things for you. It's going to cure your ingrowing toenails. It's going to make you less bald. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. Drink it. And you say, no, I don't want to drink it. You must drink it. You've got to drink it. I'm, I'm your doctor. I'm telling you, you've got to drink it. If he or she tried to do that to you, he or she could lose their license. You're not. You've got to tell the the patient what the drug is good for, you've got to tell them what it's bad for, the side effects, and then they, in theory, make up their minds. This has been ripped away from us. Water fluoridation is the dispensing of a drug. This is not chlorine. This is not any number of the other uh, chemicals that are used to treat the water. Fluoride is being put in specifically to alter you physically to make a physical change in you. Fluoride is a drug, is a medicine. This is the only thing anywhere in the world that gets added to the municipal drinking waters to actually treat the human. Well, anytime you see the letters F-L-U-O, you're talking fluoride. And so when you start realizing that Prozac is a, is a fluoride product, Zoloft is a fluoride product, virtually all of your psychotropic drugs, almost all of those that are mood elevators, and one of the reasons being is because it has this tremendous capacity to affect serotonin. Mm -hmm. Serotonin being the chemical that goes from one neuron to the other brain neuron. And so when we looked at the selective serotonin reuptake, and when basically an inhibit inhibition of the serotonin to be taken up, that's the fluoride that's doing that. Prozac is fluoxetine. It's a fluorinated psychoactive. Matter of fact, all, almost all your psychoactive drugs are fluorinated drugs. They put it in there both as, as a carrier and an accelerator of the effect. The actual active ingredient in Prozac is fluoride. Prozac is made almost entirely from fluoride molecules. It is, an, like SSRI drugs, are similar molecularly to some of the elements in fluoride. Remember the school shootings in Columbine, Colorado? Yes. They were on SSRI drugs. Those drugs make your mind think that you're not living in the real world, that you're actually just sort of experiencing a, a false reality. And I think fluoride has much the same effect. There's tons of uh, products that are pharmaceutical products that in some cases, the fluoride is just being used to what, they, what I call potentiate it, mm -hmm. uh, to actually make it a stronger one. Uh, Fenfen which was uh, the diet drug that yeah, uh, was taken off, that. The, taken off the, well, wh why did they take it off? Well, fenfluramine, you can hear the fluoride part in there. The fenfluramine was the part that actually made the thickening of the heart valves so that they pulled off. Amazing part about it is, is rohypnol, the date rape drug. A lot of people just yeah, call it that. The roofie. Okay, yeah, right. roofie. Yeah. yeah, and so what does that roofie do? Basically, it, it causes an anterograde amnesia. Well, okay, that's a fluoride product, so how does it do that? Well, we probably should have guessed that it would do that already anyway, mm -hmm. because if you went in and had uh, surgery, general surgery right now, knock on wood that you don't have to ever do that, but if you were, they would give you four molecules of fluorine and two of bromine and one of chlorine, and that's what knocks you out during that sure. time. So the truth is is that when you start looking at all the pharmaceutical uses for it, that it's, it's just amazing all the things that, has been, that, that are around us all the time that we didn't recognize or that we didn't see. There is absolutely no drug on the market that's given in a one dose fits all situation. We don't put other things in the water to try to keep everybody's blood pressure down or everybody's stroke risk down. And there's no reason why we should be trying a one size fits all approach for this either. Once you put a, a medicine in the drinking water, you can't control the dose because you can't control how much water people drink. You can't control who gets it, it goes to everybody. If you ask a pharmacist if there's any drug in his store that was safe enough to give to everyone, young people, old people, sick people, people with poor nutrition, give it to them in any dose, they'd laugh at you. It's ridiculous. There's no way you can give out a medicine without being able to control the dose. And one dose cannot fit all and you can't give a medicine to everybody. 
You are forcing it on people who don't want it. There are people in this audience who've spent far more time researching this issue, including David, myself, and many other people in this audience, and they've stated categorically to the mayor, to the city councillors, we do not want you to force this medicine on us. We have the right to informed consent to medication. That's a very important right. This is a violation. It's being violated every day in this country to over 200 million people. There needs to be informed consent. We have that with all other medications. When we go to the doctor, he or she gives us the information of what the side effects are going to be. With fluoride, there is no informed consent. There is no safe dose for one size, this one size fits all medication that they're doing to us. Now, all of those issues are important, but the one that really concerns me is the impact of fluoride on the brain. A study panel for the EPA listed fluoride as amongst 109 chemicals for which there was significant evidence of neurological effects. It has definite impact on the neurons, which is the nerve parts of the brain. You don't just grow those back. It's not like, well, I cut myself, so now I'm renewing my cell. It doesn't happen to the neurons. There are so many ways that fluoride could be damaging the brain. We know this from animal studies. Dr. Phyllis Moulinex exposed rats to fluoride to work out its effects on the human brain and the central nervous system. What we did was we exposed them, let them drink the fluoride in the water for six to 20 weeks. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening to the results, he says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. Look, the first opponents of fluoridation in this country in the 1950s were biochemists. These biochemists had used fluoride in their experiments to poison enzymes. And they, including Dr. James Sumner, who won the Nobel Prize for enzyme chemistry at Cornell, and he said, fluoride poisons enzymes. You don't want to put this substance into the body. Poisoning enzymes is what makes people sick. Poisoning enzymes is what kills people. It's highly likely that you're going to get subtle effects on the brain that the parent is not going to notice. No wonder that our children can't read and write. It's no wonder because we're damaging their brains with a stupid preventive dentistry program that doesn't even work. We have behavioral studies and we have 24 IQ studies, 24 studies, which now show an association between fairly modest exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ. They've actually got it down to a one milligram dose of fluoride causes a 0.59 loss in IQ points. The average IQ is 100. So if you're 95, you're in the back of the class napping because you can't understand what the person in the front is saying and you're going to get a nice job pushing the broom around. So what if you got twice that dose? Okay, you're down to 90. So what they showed in studies in other countries is that you lose all your genius out of your society. You've damaged the intellect. But new research from China supports Dr. Mullenex's conclusion that fluoride affects mental development and IQ levels. I've heard a great deal about a chemical that can be used on the teeth to help prevent decay. Is that a good thing to use? It certainly is. We use a fluoride solution, and we have evidence that for some people... Fifty years ago, American government scientists had clinical evidence that fluoride affected the central nervous system. But all this was kept secret. Chemical? You're going to put some chemical in my mouth? All mention of, of the effects of fluoride on the central nervous system was stopped. In my view, fluoride is where lead was in the early 70s. That argument lasted about 10 years, and it was finally proven that, yes, low levels of lead, lower than caused visible symptoms, was in fact damaging a child's mental development. I think the same thing we're going to find with fluoride. As someone who has gotten off of fluoride, 
I can tell that my thought processes and my concentration is higher. And so when you damage the IQ of the children, you lose your place in the country as a leader, and we have. And that's because of the damage that our government has allowed to happen to the intelligence of our children. If there wasn't research out there that's shown conclusively that it affects the brain and the neurons, that it affects the immune system, that it affects the bones, and it is incorporated into your body, fluoride bonding is strong. You get something with fluoride bonded, it's not easy to get it off. Well, what's going on? Fluoride is now in thousands, and I really mean thousands of products, where it has worked its way in, and I, I don't understand why. I had a good friend of mine come up to me one day when I still live in the valley. He says, Karen, he says, look, there's fluoride in, in Cocoa Pops, and there's fluoride in Fruit Loops, and there's, I'm going, what? What the heck is it doing? <laughs> and that stuff, pesticides, operate in a lot of cases because they have fluoridated compounds. Sadly, the dentists have begun to add fluoride to their filling materials, their cements, their, they even put a varnish on children's teeth. I don't believe these have been legitimately FDA approved. I've checked on them. There's no uh, new drug applications on file for fluoride to be ingested and none have been submitted. So if you're going to give a child a dose of fluoride, show me the FDA approval where that's beneficial and even safe. It doesn't exist. The medical system that tries to say we need to ingest fluoride that's really the only element they believe in. They won't recommend magnesium to reduce heart attacks. They won't recommend calcium. They won't recommend zinc for immune boosting function. They only believe in one element, and it's fluorine. Mm -hmm. You know, they, how come they don't look at the other elements that are needed? It's, 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 see, that's why it's very selective. It's a dogma. There is no you know, selenium waste product that they have to get rid of. That's why you don't hear about the benefits of selenium from industry. Right. But selenium is an anti-cancer element and most people are deficient in it. You know, chromium, trace element for blood sugar regulation. Most people are deficient in it. Why don't doctors and scientists say, let's put chromium in the water? Because they're not trying to get rid of it as a toxic waste. That's why. You know, if you look at the, the, the table of elements, you gotta consider the whole thing. It's not scientific to say, well, let's just put this one element in the water. Well, what about all these others? Water fluoridation is a hoax. It's not scientific, it's not good medicine, it's not public health policy. It's a, a desperate attempt by certain industries to eliminate a toxic poison by feeding it to the people and calling it public health when it's clearly waste disposal. It comes down to this? Yeah, the government's paying 35 dentists at the Center for Disease Control to go out and promote the addition of silico fluoride to the public drinking water. So it's making a lot of people who can't do dentistry money. Where money and power are is a magnet to criminals. And so Washington, D.C. becomes a vortex of evil. And I'll tell you, when you're controlled by a few people, which is the government, who controls the government? Money. Big money. And if they're about money, then we have a conflict of interest. We want our children to grow up healthy and strong, and they want to make profits. There are solutions out there. There are answers to this. There's a ways to get around and, and possibly clean up your system. What can we do? The best thing you can do is look at what the body's made of, which is water. Every living substance is composed of water. You know, people ask me, what's the easiest, simplest way to start regaining my health? I say, change the water. When you start flooding your body with water, if you have no access to anything else, no supplements, and eating clean foods, which would mean raw, organic fruits and vegetables. And if you have access to superfoods, which would be like corella, spirulina, blue-green algae, stuff like that, I still think that distilled water is the best. I recommend adding organic apple cider vinegar to their distilled water because what it does is it brings it back to life. You know, when you distilled water, you lose a lot, all the minerals in it. You know, it's a clean water, but it's not an active live water. So what I do and what I recommend, you can get a distiller for three or four hundred dollars and run your tap water right through the distillation unit and fill up your five gallon water containers. And then every time that you fill it up, put a little cap full of organic apple cider vinegar in there, the raw kind, and then you're getting vital nutrients, live enzymes, probiotics, and it's just one of the cheapest, most effective ways 
to regain your health or to just you know give you a lot of good active live nutrients and it brings the water back to life and but you know the big problem is you can get the best water in the world to drink and cook with but what are you going to do about your shower? In fact, I would even say don't shower in tap water. That's so toxic that, look, where, where I live now, I'm drinking and showering in either rainwater or well water. If we have the ability financially to purchase these filters and these purification systems, it is the most important investment you could make in your, for your family. You really need to invest in yourself, in your food, in what you're drinking, and more than you are your clothes or your electronics or your car, it is the priority. When you accumulate all these chemicals in your body, you have to do something to get rid of it. The antidote to fluoride poisoning is calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, selenium, and iodine. And you can get rid of it with perspiration, which is saunas. You can get rid of it by drinking more water and having it go out in your urine. The right diet can bind to those elements and help clear them out. I am not drinking any more water with fluoride. I'm not eating foods with fluoride. I'm not cooking my pasta rice soups with the fluoridated water. So I completely took it out of my diet. Considering the fact that the fluoride toxicity has become a huge problem, I kind of teamed up with Alex Jones and his staff over there. And I was asked, what can we do? There's no product on the market that targets specifically fluoride detoxification or fluoride cleansing. So I was asked to put something together that would do that. It's really a combination of six of the most potent compounds we could find working together in unison to help you eliminate or detoxify fluoride from your system on a regular basis. This product is something that people can take on a daily basis or take on a weekly basis or take to help their body naturally eliminate fluoride from their system. There are two strategies for really getting fluoride out of the water supply. One is that you can have the citizens, you know, protest, mm -hmm. go to the city council meetings, rise up against the chemical tyrants, and demand clean water. Just demand clean water, that's it. And if more people would do something like this instead of just turning a blind eye, that's what's wrong with our country. Mm -hmm. People see wrongdoing, but they just pass it by, let somebody else take care of it. So I imagine you're kind of going to be the Lone Ranger standing up and saying I don't want my water medicated anymore. We should be calling our congressmen and trying to say hey you know. What are you doing out there? What, 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 what are you doing around the well? That's our water. I should have to choose if I want fluoride in my water. Why am I demanded that I have to have fluoride in my water? If enough people will contact their legislators contact them either through phone calls, through snail mail. I mean, if they get enough of that on a particular issue, by golly, they do set up and take notice. Go there and bitch, because that's your public servant, okay? Last time I checked, they work for you. You gotta get a lot of people angry enough that they'll go out and stand in the rain and tell the city council that they're not gonna get reelected if they don't do what we tell them. They're not gonna keep their seat if they continue to poison our water. If you follow the democratic process, then this issue has already been solved. Unite and let's make it happen because that's, I was thinking about it today, and I'll just wrap with this, but I was thinking about it today because I knew you were coming over, and I just sat there and I just, I literally just prayed to God. I said, God, I don't know what, there's got to be a way. Open up a way that we can help this nation and the world get its health back and let health be the number one priority and profits the next, not profits over health. And let's let people get the truth. This is all about us taking our world back. It's the time to scream louder, to be bolder, and to show them that we, got, we cannot be afraid. It's time that the people uh, stand up, the silent majority, for, for their health. Get it out of your community, and then you can drink the water at home, you can drink the water in your office, you can drink the water in the restaurants and in friends' houses, and so you don't have to worry anymore. The alleged reason for adding fluoride to the public water supply is to reduce tooth decay. But tooth decay isn't caused by a deficiency of fluoride. It's caused because there's scum on the teeth and bad diet. So the real solution is to take 
something like a nice toothbrush that was invented by C.C. Bash, cram it in the gums, and knock the scum off. So if you really wanted to reuse this tooth decay, you'd make sure that every child had a big handful of toothbrushes and knew how to use them. And you dig all the scum off the gums because it's scum living on the teeth that causes tooth decay. I don't want to poison this scum, I want to scrub it off the teeth and then not feed it. So you don't give it sugar, white flour, and bad food, processed foods. You give it good foods. Then you will have wonderful teeth and abundant good health. Is there hope? There's always hope. I mean, that's what I tell everybody. Even when I had cancer patients, I always say, listen, there's always hope. When you feel healthy, you feel self-confident. And when you feel self-confident, you feel successful. So regardless of how bad things are, you can never lose hope. I mean, you always have to know that there's always change and there's always things you can do. Even if you do one tiny thing every single day, you're still positively changing. And if you tell one person or if you pass an email out or you share information, once we hit critical point, which we're almost at, it's like the hundredth monkey phenomenon. The mass consciousness will change. And I believe we're almost there. So never give up and always, no matter what, never give up hope because that's what you have. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're such a sweet, sweet soul. <laughs> Again, Charlie, thank you so much for letting us come by here today. Well, I would just like to say, great speech, man. Thank you for all your work you've done over the years and your discoveries and your journey and your just everything. Thank you so much. Appreciate Welcome. it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, You're make, good you man. Do. You're the man. Okay, Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a treat. It's a pleasure to talk to you and, and I'm hoping that this will get the message to more and more people. Now this is fantastic. It's going to be a great educational tool and, and we appreciate you being here and thank you so much and we'll look forward to, look forward to seeing you again. Likewise. Thanks for having me. You guys are incredibly powerful, and I want to say thank you for what you're doing for all of us. I really wish this project the greatest success. People need to hear this message from, from all, the, all of those that you've interviewed. This is powerful information, and uh, I imagine that in 50 years, people will be watching this. You know, some DVDs will survive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just got the chills. <laughs> and they'll be watching this, and they'll look back and say, uh, there were some filmmakers who did know what they were covering who weren't willing to just sell out and, and do some explosions and on-screen sex and this and that. They actually had a message for humanity. That's what you guys are doing.